Welcome to another episode of Reading Together from Seaharp Press. I'm Eugene Lunning, co-founder of Seaharp, and we are continuing to investigate Abide in Christ by Andrew Murray. In my opinion, one of his greatest books and one of certainly my favorite in the Timeless series from Seaharp Press. In our last episode, we looked at day six or chapter six. So today we'll be continuing our journey in day seven. So again, Abide in Christ by Andrew Murray. And let's get diving in. This chapter is entitled, Abide in Christ as Your Wisdom. The quotation at the beginning is 1 Corinthians 1.30. Of God are ye in Christ Jesus, who was made unto us wisdom from God, both righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus Christ is not only priest to purchase and king to secure, but also prophet to reveal to us the salvation which God hath prepared for them that love him. Just as at the creation, the light was first called into existence, that in it all God's other works might have their life and beauty. So in our text, wisdom is mentioned first as the treasury in which are to be found the three precious gifts that follow. The life is the light of man. It is in revealing to us and making us behold the glory of God in his own face that Christ makes us partakers of eternal life. It was by the tree of knowledge that sin came. It is through the knowledge that Christ gives that salvation comes. He is made of God unto us wisdom. In him are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I wonder if, like me, you're interested in the life of the mind. I have to be honest, maybe you've already noticed, I am a nerd, so I'm fascinated by philosophy, by the wisdoms, yes, of man, and I cannot ever get more amazed by the fact that we, like Andrew Murray says, have been given all the wisdom of God in the person of Jesus. So I have to say, as we dive into this chapter, as a resident nerd in your fellowship, I'm delighted to continue to think about what does it mean that in Jesus we receive all the wisdom of God? That just like Murray says, at the creation, the light illuminated all that was to be created. So in Jesus, having his words, having his presence by the Spirit, we have all the wisdom of the ages. What an awesome and wonderful thought to begin this chapter with. Let's continue. And of God, you are in him, and have but to abide in him, to be made partaker of these treasures of wisdom. In him you are, and in him the wisdom is. Dwelling in him, you dwell in the very fountain of all light. Abiding in him, you have Christ, the wisdom of God, leading your whole spiritual life, and ready to communicate in the form of knowledge just as much as is needful for you to know. Christ is made unto us wisdom. You are in Christ. Isn't it lovely that as we abide in Jesus, we are being fed, sort of uh, like we've talked about before with the sap that is the Holy Spirit. We are being given both the sap that will create fruit, but also is our leadership, uh, our understanding. Uh, you and I have right now as much as he has desired to reveal to us. Can we ask for more? Of course. That is given to us as a promise throughout, that whatever we would ask, we will be revealed. But I love that as we abide in Jesus, we are being given exactly what he wants us to know of his wisdom, of his knowledge, of even his leading, leading pardon me, of where he wants to take us, where he wants us to go. This is mysterious, but it's also practical. We'll continue. It is this connection between what Christ has been made of God to us and how we have it only as also being in him that we must learn to understand better. We shall thus see 
that the blessings prepared for us in Christ cannot be obtained as special gifts in answer to prayer apart from the abiding in him. The answer to each prayer must come in the closer union and the deeper abiding in him. In him, the unspeakable gift, all other gifts are treasured up. The gift of wisdom and knowledge too. Even as I was reading those words, an image came to mind for me. Do you remember on the night before the cross, I believe it's in John's gospel because it does say the disciple whom he loved. Do you remember when there's the conversation about who is going to betray Jesus right there as they're sitting at the supper table? And the language in John's gospel referring to himself makes it sound like his head is almost like leaned against Jesus' shoulder, almost his chest. And so to ask of Jesus, who are you talking about? It's like he has to just barely turn his head. That's how intimate their connection was. I think that's what we're getting here. That the intimacy into which we've been called, the abiding, is such that when we desire uh, clarification, a little more knowledge, more wisdom for our life and following Jesus, it's like we barely have to turn our head. We're already resting our head upon his chest. That's the kind of intimacy into which he wants to draw you and me. Isn't that lovely? Doesn't that sound far more glorious, more beautiful than a lot of what we think Christian discipleship is? Let's keep going. How often have you longed for wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might know God better? Whom to know is life eternal. Abide in Jesus. Your life in him will lead you to that fellowship with God in which the only true knowledge of God is to be had. His love, his power, his infinite glory will as you abide in Jesus, be so revealed as it hath not entered into the heart of man to conceive. You may not be able to grasp it with the understanding or to express it in words, but the knowledge which is deeper than thoughts or words will be given. The knowing of God which comes of being known of him. We preach Christ crucified unto them which are called. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. I wonder if that's what Jesus meant when he talked the night before the cross about the peace which he gives. It's unlike the world. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. The peace of the world would mean just a lack of strife or ease. I think the peace of Jesus is like this. We cannot fully grasp it with our understanding. Uh, sometimes we cannot express it with words. But have you ever had that experience? You're going through a day and your circumstances are difficult. And yet somewhere inside your spirit, there is like this breath. Oh, it is okay. I am with you. I will be your peace. I think that is the very nature of what it means to abide in him. Inexpressible unspeakably glorious and sometimes it's just like a breath let's continue or you would fain count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of jesus christ your lord abide in jesus and be found in him you shall know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings following him you shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. It is only when God shines into the heart and Christ Jesus dwells there that the light of the knowledge of God in the face of Christ can be seen. Or would you understand his blessed work as he wrought it on earth or works it from heaven by his spirit? Would you know how Christ can become our righteousness and our sanctification and redemption? It is just as bringing and revealing and communicating these that he has made unto us wisdom from God. There are a thousand questions that at times come up, and the attempt to answer them becomes a weariness and a burden. 
it is because you have forgotten you are in Christ, whom God has made to be your wisdom. Let it be your first care to abide in him in undivided, fervent devotion of heart. When the heart and the life are right, rooted in Christ, knowledge will come in such measure as Christ's own wisdom sees meet. And without such abiding in Christ, the knowledge does not really profit, but is often most hurtful. The soul satisfies itself with thoughts which are but the forms and images of truth without receiving the truth itself in its power. God's way is ever first to give us, even though it be but as a seed, the thing itself, the life and the power, and then the knowledge. Man seeks the knowledge first, and often, alas, never gets beyond it. God gives us Christ, and in him hid the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Oh, let us be content to possess Christ, to dwell in him, to make him our life, and only in a deeper searching into him to search and find the knowledge we desire. Such knowledge is life indeed. I think Murray is pointing out one of the great uh, pitfalls of the modern, let's even call it American or certainly Western Christian tradition. Maybe you've looked into this, but there is a, a strain of, even call it Platonism, Aristotelianism, this way that the knowledges of man kind of got woven into the church throughout, you know, sort of the medieval days, even earlier than that. And it made people think that you needed to understand to believe. As I often try and do both with you, my friends, and often when I get to teach or do a retreat, I remind people that the way Jesus revealed himself to his original disciples is I truly believe the way he's still trying to do it. He wants to reveal himself to people, and then he, the wisdom and knowledge of God, will teach them. So it's not for you to have perfectly understood, orthodox, uh, aligned, uh, just perfection uh, of theology, uh, of knowledge about God. It is for you to know him. However he first revealed himself to you, begin there. The way that he spoke and whispered to your heart, drawing you close so you almost could feel his presence, that's how it's supposed to be. So our knowledges, our ways that we have come to understand it and to be able to codify it and make it clear to other people in an intellectual way, often, like he says here, will get in the way of our experience of his presence. So I'm not anti-knowledge. Again, I am a nerd. But I want to remind you that you need to know Jesus before you try and stack on things that you know about Jesus. Let's continue. Therefore, believer, abide in Jesus as your wisdom and expect from him most confidently whatever teaching you may need for a life to the glory of the Father. In all that concerns your spiritual life, Abide in Jesus as your wisdom. The life you have in Christ is a thing of infinite sacredness, far too high and holy for you to know how to act it out. It is he alone who can guide you, as by a secret spiritual instinct, to know what is becoming your dignity as a child of God, what will help you and what will hinder your inner life and especially your abiding in him. Do not think of it as a mystery or a difficulty you must solve. Whatever questions come up as to the possibility of abiding perfectly and uninterruptedly in him, and of really obtaining all the blessing that comes from it, always remember, he knows. All is perfectly clear to him, and he is my wisdom. Just as much as you need to know and are capable of apprehending 
will be communicated if you only trust him. Never think of the riches of wisdom and knowledge hid in Jesus as treasures without a key or of your way as a path without a light. Jesus, your wisdom, is guiding you in the right way even when you do not see it. I want to go back to what I was just saying before that paragraph. I think sometimes we lean into our intellectual knowledges about Jesus because we're secretly afraid that he's not alive enough to present himself. So it's easier to sit perhaps in a pew and get what you can from that person up front who seems to know him perhaps better than you. And we go through our then Monday through Saturday not really seeking after experience of his presence. I love when it says here, the life you have in Christ is a thing of infinite sacredness, far too high and holy for you to know how to act it out. Friends, this is high. This is holy. And the glorious present that he offers us, like this gift that he wants to reach out and give to you, is himself. Not just as he was 2,000 plus years ago, but as he is right now. He wants to show you how to follow him, how to experience his affection. Would you let him? Would you believe that he is actually alive to do that? That's the mystery and the goodness of the Christian life. Not to just have aligned thinking, but to have experience. We'll continue on. In all your experience with the blessed word, Remember the same truth. Abide in Jesus, your wisdom. Study much to know the written word, but study more to know the living word in whom you are of God. Jesus, the wisdom of God, is only known by a life of implicit confidence and obedience. The words he speaks are spirit and life to those who live in him. Therefore, each time you read or hear or meditate upon the word, be careful to take up your true position. Realize first your oneness with him, who is the wisdom of God. Know yourself to be under his direct and special training. Go to the word abiding in him, the very fountain of divine light. In his light you shall see light. So quite clearly, Murray is not telling us, and this would be deeply unorthodox, not to be studying the written word of God, both Old Testament and New Testament. But Murray is kind of poking at this idea that we should only read and not sit and experience by the Spirit, the living Jesus. So friends, how often do you rise from your reading and let's say go for a walk to pray and to be in the presence of Jesus himself. How often? How often when your day has gone off the rails do you pause and think, he's with me. I'll talk to him about it. That's a whole lot different attitude of prayer. And it is the prayer that abiding lends it to us. This is where we have to be in the presence of Jesus. Let's continue. In all your daily life, its ways and its work, Abide in Jesus as your wisdom. Your body and your daily life share in the great salvation. In Christ, the wisdom of God, provision has been made for their guidance too. Your body is his temple. Your daily life the sphere for glorifying him. It is to him a matter of deep interest that all your earthly concerns should be guided aright. Only trust his sympathy, believe his love, and wait for his guidance. It will be given. Abiding in him, the mind will be calmed and freed from passion, the judgment cleared and strengthened. The light of heaven will shine on earthly things, and your prayer for wisdom, like Solomon's, will be fulfilled above what you ask or think. 
Friends, we are not all called to be a missionary in this sort of classic sense. We are not all meant to necessarily go to seminary to become some sort of a pastor or minister. But according to what we're told in the New Testament, we are all meant to be a priesthood of believers whose daily actions are actually pointing to Jesus. So whether you're a banker or a teacher, you stay at home with your kids, you're, you're driving a bus, you're an executive, whatever kind of a person you are, you are meant to live that in the light of Jesus for the purposes of Jesus. And the only way we can learn to be all of those vocations in him is from him. So to rise in the morning, to align our heart with him, and to abide all day long is the highest expression of your human life. There is nothing else for you, no matter your vocation. And who will teach you to do it? Jesus. Yes, again, by his word and by the fact that he is the word, the living word. Let's continue. And so, especially in any work you do for God, abide in Jesus as your wisdom. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We looked at that scripture in the last episode. Let all fear or doubt, lest we should not know exactly what these works are, be put far away. In Christ, we are created for them. He will show what they are and how to do them. Cultivate the habit of rejoicing in the assurance that the divine wisdom is guiding you, even where you do not yet see the way. All that you can wish to know is perfectly clear to him. As man, as mediator, he has access to the counsels of deity, to the secrets of providence in your interest and on your behalf. If you will but trust him fully and abide in him entirely, you can be confident of having unerring guidance. Often at the end of a Sunday gathering where I'm with my friends, if I get the opportunity to pray for the week ahead, I will often intone the same words. Lord, we have no idea what you're, we're doing. We, we have no idea what this week holds, but you know. Isn't it a fabulous thing to wake, let's say, on a Monday or to be falling asleep on a Sunday night with that feeling of anxiety about the week ahead in your heart? Isn't it unbelievable that we know the one who knows everything that is to come, that is in fact ordering our steps aright, who in calling us to abide in him promises to make it clear, to be the light that will shine and show us the way? This is our life in him. It's so good, so glorious, and I think we take it for granted. Let's keep reading. Yes, abide in Jesus as your wisdom. Seek to maintain the spirit of waiting and dependence that always seeks to learn and will not move, but as the heavenly light leads on. Withdraw yourself from all needless distraction. Close your ears to the voices of the world and be as a docile learner, ever listening for the heavenly wisdom the master has to teach. Surrender all your own wisdom. Seek a deep conviction of the utter blindness of the natural understanding in the things of God. And both as to what you have to believe and what to do, wait for Jesus to teach and to guide. Remember that the teaching and guidance come not from without. It is by his life in us that the divine wisdom does his work. Retire frequently with him into the inner chamber of the heart, where the gentle voice of the Spirit is only heard if all be still. Hold fast with unshaken confidence, even in the midst of darkness and apparent desertion, his own assurance that he is the light and the leader of his own. And live above all, day by day in the blessed truth that, as he himself, the living Jesus Christ, 
is your wisdom, your first and last care must ever be this alone, to abide in him. Abiding in him, his wisdom will come to you as the spontaneous outflowing of a life rooted in him. I am, I abide in Christ, who was made unto us wisdom from God. Wisdom will be given me. Wasn't it a gorgeous turn of phrase that we receive his counsel not from without, but I love the language here. I just think it's so beautiful that you and I are called to retire frequently with him into the inner chamber of the heart. Do you ever think about the fact that the place, uh, let's call it the temple, in which the living God chooses now to dwell in this, the new covenant, is you? That you can retire from all the world around you. Go here and meet with the Godhead. In fact, could I pray for us as we close out this chapter? Let's pray for that sort of a meeting with him in this day and in this week. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you would be our wisdom. You would be the one who teaches us how and what it will mean to abide in you, to draw all life from you. So I pray for my friends who are watching this, that there would be an infilling of your peace, that they would retire frequently into their inner life, where you have chosen by your spirit to dwell. And that the way that they even receive this prayer right now would lend itself to your peace, to your calm, to that same unhurried way that you went through your schedule day by day of your human life. That's how we want to live in you. So come, Lord Jesus, be our peace. And just as Andrew Murray said in this particular chapter, come and be our wisdom. Teach us. Show us the way. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Friends, I can't tell you what an honor it is to slow down in my own day, one day at a time, and to be with you in Abide in Christ by Andrew Murray. I hope that this day, day seven of the book, has been a blessing to you. I feel myself moved toward a place of peace. And I love just this thought that I can seek his wisdom today by simply abiding in him. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I look forward to our next chapter. Thanks for joining me yet again for reading together with Seahart Press.